Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 179. I want to thank you for taking the time to join me on this episode. So we are restarting um, some of the the teaching um, aspect of uh, these episodes, so I'm excited to jump into what I have to share with you today, and uh, we'll just jump right into it. It actually came through just reading some a portion in my own you know, private reading, and it was it was pretty profound. Something hit me from a new perspective that I never noticed before. Um, I love how Scripture does that. How the Holy Spirit leads you into new discovery, despite having seen it a thousand times. So uh, it's wonderful how that works. We are going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 25. Uh, We'll start in verse 14, and um, we'll just kind of see how it goes, um, point out some things and uh, some little uh, nuggets, if you will, um, and uh, hope it's a blessing. So we'll just jump right in. Starting in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus uh, is saying here again, It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, I want to just kind of point out some things. Uh, bring some things to your attention, perhaps, and hopefully. When when Jesus picks up there in verse 14, he starts off by saying, again, it will be like a man going on a journey. So saying the word again should 
clue you in that he's tying it back to something he's previously said. Well, what would that be? Well, that should be at the beginning of verse of chapter 25, verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like, and he gives this parable of the ten virgins. Now, something to note is Matthew, when he speaks of the kingdom, he ties it to the phrase of heaven. Now, it's important to not get tied to the thinking that what he's saying here specifically relates to what we think of as heaven. Remember, Matthew is writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, and for Matthew and his Jewish readers to to write or to read the name or the word God would be uh, offensive to them, uh, something that they would not have the privilege or right to, to say or to write. So we see Matthew use the phrase kingdom of heaven. Now, if you are familiar with the difference in, say, the gospel of Luke, he uses the phrase kingdom of God. Now, when we say kingdom of God and then we say kingdom of heaven, we automatically have some kind of presuppositions in that. Uh, when you say kingdom of heaven, you think of heaven, and when you think of God, you think more of God. It is, though, relevant to consider them to be detailing both the same thing, but they word it in such a way that um, our delicate um, paradigms can tolerate them. So I say that to say don't don't read kingdom of heaven and automatically assume that what we're talking about here has to do with heaven. Um, a better way to perhaps phrase it may be the kingdom of God. That encompasses, it's better, it, perhaps easier for us to digest as to what that might entail rather than just thinking of it as heaven. So I want to inject that thought in there uh, kind of at the onset. So we're speaking, he's, Jesus is saying again, so he's reiterating something he said at the beginning of uh, chapter 25, at the time, at that time, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God will be like, and giving the parable. Now, you should then think at that time, what time are we talking about? Well, you backpedal a bit more, and you find there's quite a dialogue, uh, or a monologue, rather, of Jesus speaking regarding, we see it in, in Matthew 24, starting in verse 36, Jesus is talking about the day and the hour that no one knows of, not even the angels in heaven nor the sun, which should blow your mind to think of. How can the Son not know something that the Father knows? And the, there's no question of their oneness. So that should be quite a paradigm to, to try to process and chew on. But only the Father knows. So we're talking about this day, this return of the Lord. And Jesus is explaining at that time, that is, in the time of the return of the Lord, the kingdom of God will be like these parables. So that gives us a little bit of context, a little framework for how we can process some of this. Um, I think one could spend their entire life and even career if you perhaps um, trying to unpack and process the richness of this of these texts um, and still never reach the end of them so uh, but it's 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 a wonderful thing to to navigate so we're talking about uh, contextually the 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 time of the return of the Lord and the kingdom of God so what I what I next want to point out is as Jesus is unpacking and giving us this 
parable, which is kind of a way to parallel something in in natural terms or more digestible terms so that we can process what he's trying to teach. Now, it's often easy to just take what he says in parables and to automatically process it through the lens of, okay, there there must be something spiritual about this. And no doubt there are spiritual implications. No doubt the parables have certain representations, you know, who represents what in these parables that's important to navigate. Never stop looking and asking those questions. But don't disqualify from the parables the plain way in which Jesus speaks and teaches on things. Um, sometimes we, what they say, you can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, sometimes you look, you try to look so deep into something that you miss the thing on the very surface. So this is indeed what kind of happened or transpired with me. Um, I have had in my thinking more lately um, the aspect of finances. And in light of that topic that I've been mentally, myself, just privately chewing on, thinking of, that's the light that was shed in this particular parable. And I've also shared that concept of, okay, there's something more spiritual to it. And you know, we're not just talking about money here or finances. But what's important to notice is, well, finances and money are riddled through this parable. They are so deeply uh, woven into the fabrics of what Jesus is saying that um, it would be unfair of us in our pursuit of understanding it to try to to try to draw that out of the equation at all. Draw it out as as in to disqualify that from being something Jesus is speaking of here. So my what I am saying is um, very much this is a parable uh, regarding finances, regarding, to say it plainly, money. Money is used as the example in the parable. So what is it that I'm learning from this? Well, to to just briefly point out, there are, well, we had three types of individuals, three individuals in this parable. Two turned what they were given in and doubled what they initially started with. So we go back to this text here. Um, he had servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So the wealth came from this from this master. And to one he gave five bags of gold. Now, this I'm reading out at the NIV. Um, yours may say talents. Uh, that was the Greek uh, word here. Uh, so five talents to one, two talents to another, and one talent to the third. Now, just of importance of note here, a talent was worth about 20 years of a day laborer's wage. So when you think about, and, and I've spoken of this in previous episodes, when you think about five talents, that would be a hundred years of a day laborer's wage. So that's a substantial sum of money. We're not just talking about, you know, this little, you know, bag of coins. That would be equivalent to a hundred years worth of working. I'm sure the life expectancy in that day was not near a hundred years worth. And then likewise, um, two talents would be about 40 years. and One talent would be about 20 years worth. So you see the significance of the money. And this master entrusted his wealth to them. And this is important. He gave to each according to his ability. Now that's fascinating to consider and important to consider. The master, notice, didn't give them 
equal measures. He did give them according to um, their ability. So that would tell us that um, God does give in ways that are according to our ability. So that's one important point. Now, back to some new revelations regarding this. So two of these servants took what they got and they doubled it. They multiplied it. That's really the word that I want you to really grab a hold of, multiplied. Um, God, throughout the scripture, we see, even Old and New Testament, God is very interested in multiplication. He wants he wants his resources, his creation. He gave an innate ability to multiply itself. Think of plants and seeds and fruit and seeds and all these things. Ingrained in all of his creation is this innate ability to multiply. Think of humanity and their ability to procreate. Multiplication is th- is very, very scriptural. So this master was interested in multiplication. What was he not interested in? Well, if we look at the third servant, what did he do? He took what the master had and was what? Afraid of his master. Why would he... What was he afraid of? He knew his master wanted a multiplication, but what did he do? He hid it because he was afraid. What was he afraid of? Losing it. Now, don't don't lose connection with the fact that we're still talking about money. So, this servant, who was identified as um, wicked and lazy, that's a that's a hard blow there. Wicked and lazy, he 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 took what was given, and he hid it. He kept it safe. He saved it. Now, you may have some little you know red flags throwing up there in inside your head, and uh, I'm not saying that um, to save money is not biblical. Uh, saving money is important. Um, so we're not we're not saying that or making this claim. But when we think about the specific examples in this parable, there was a blessing and a reward. There was a being a a pleasure from the master in multiplication. They took what was given to them, they put it to work, and they returned a multiplication. Notice that they also were given they were given in this instance they were faithful uh, they they were good and faithful servants, been faithful with a few things, put you in charge of many things. So here in this particular example, their reward is the same that we can tell. They are commended for their excellency and they were faithful, and they are put in charge of many things. And come and share your master's happiness. So their commendation was the same. Their result was different. One went from five to ten, and then the other went from two to four. So the result was different, but their commendation was the same. That's a, that's, that's a valuable learning one one other thing though is when we think about what god gives us both in through our personality through how he's uniquely wired us and we start to understand kind of how we're wired and what we're interested in and each of us in our own unique way we are then god gives us blessings of resources. Um, here specifically, I'm speaking of money. But but of course, absolutely in other ways. But specifically, he gives us money. 
And if we are afraid to put it to work so that it can be multiplied, then are we not too in jeopardy of resulting the same as what he called the wicked and lazy servant? This servant seems very reasonable in his action. He saved it and kept it safe. But would this be equivalent to, say, you or I putting, you know, just tucking away our uh, finances because we're afraid to put it to work and to multiply it? Now, we know that Jesus is not saying, don't save your money, because he actually ends up saying, to that wicked and lazy servant, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So see, he's still, Jesus is still talking about money because you deposit it and earn interest. So we, like I said, this is riddled with talk of money. And we see that Jesus is not opposed to saving money at the bank, so to speak, because he said you should have just done that so that you could have multiplied your this money that I've given you. But rather, he saved it, uh, tucked it away, hid it. Uh, perhaps it would be equivalent to, say, you or I putting money in our, hiding in our mattress or uh, putting it in our house somewhere. Are we guilty of the same type of thing by the Lord as it relates to finances, as it relates to what we are to do with what he's blessed us financially. I think there is a call to action here uh, that I've seen newly to God has given us this blessing financially, and what will we do with it? Will we be like the wicked and lazy servant who's too afraid to put it to work for fear of losing it. You know, notice something else here. There is actually no paradigm or framework for a servant who takes what he was given and puts it to work but loses it. We don't have that example because that's everyone's fear, I would say, and that was the fear of this third servant. I'm afraid that I might lose it but we don't have that example. And even more than that, there is no other punishment aside from the one who just tucked it away and hid it to try to keep it safe. There's no, there's no mention of punishment other than for that behavior. And when I think about people who have been immensely blessed financially, those who have, you know, pursued different business ventures, um, obviously do that with caution and being very prayerful. But those who have attempted to do something financially, I've heard of some of those, you know, time after time failing and um, even, you know, falling short. Some ended up, you know, making terrible uh, moves financially, going bankrupt, all different things. But I also hear those same people continuing to press on to reach their goal of these financial moves, financial freedom, and and then you hear uh, many stories of their of their final breakthrough, of some success where it finally pushed through. And you know, I think just even Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, the KFC man spent years, uh, Colonel Sanders, I guess, sp- spent years failing and failing and failing after things. And then finally with KFC, it, it hit. And so you never you never really hear, and I've not you know flushed this out to see how accurate this is, but you never hear of of financial success stories from those who say, well, uh, the money that I had, I hid it away, and I just became um, financial. I reached this financial breakthrough by doing that. 
You never hear of those stories. You hear plenty of those stories who of those people who are willing to try to put their money to work to yield a, a multiplication, um, whichever way or facet that is, a multiplication happens and they can be a, a, an immense impact for the kingdom of God. Sure, it's great for your family. There's, you know, money creates things that you can do and enjoying life in certain ways. Um, but always remembering that that wealth is is from God and notice that these servants give it back to their master. And so that, that's the posture that we should always have with any kind of wealth is that it's not mine, it's God's, and he's entrusted it to me, and we have the intention to multiply it um, to his glory and be good stewards over it and being pleasing to him, being smart with what he's entrusted us, being hard um, at at making it work. So it's important we don't work for money, but rather we we want money to work for us. So there's a big there's a, a really big difference there, um, and it's it's big and it's subtle at the same time. Um, those people who experience financial breakthrough in various ways in their life, they they come to the discovery or the place of making the money they have work for them. And and so there's a big shift in in your life when when that paradigm change happens. Now I'm not speaking from experience, um, just from what I've learned and gathered, but um it is it is a a unique and distinct paradigm shift. Rather than working for money, your your money is working for you. And I think there's a biblical precedent here because Jesus said um, that you've put they've put that money to work. So um, he said, um, as, as I look back here, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. He says, the man in verse 16, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work. So see there, there is where I think that that carries some weight, this idea of um, your money working for you rather than you working for money, this paradigm shift. So this is this is really, I guess, as I close this out, a new perspective that I've just kind of gathered from this parable. Of course, there's many things that we can glean from this text. Um, I don't have the time, but I think it um, would be very useful for you to look at this similar parable in Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. And um, contextually, it's it's important to see that that parable is being revealed in the backdrop of thinking that the kingdom would appear all at once. And we see a, a kind of similarity in the story. Um, all three of these men are given one mina, which uh, I think is equal to about three months of wages. Um, and the two men went from one mina, made ten more. The second one went from one mina and made five more minas. And then we have again the one mina hiding it, saving it, keeping it safe, uh, returning the one mina. And what he had was taken from him and given to the one who had ten minas more. So there's kind of a, a similarity there in in story, though context could be a little different. And but absolutely there is kind of a a, a reapplication there um, that we can draw from. So explore that in your time, Luke 19, 11 through 27. Uh, see what you can what you can gather from that. But this is this is a unique uh, perspective that I've just kind of gotten to. And um, so just chew on that a bit. Uh, sometimes in the 
you know, in, in Christianity, we tend to be afraid of topics of finances and financial components, um, but we shouldn't be. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of that, and uh, we shouldn't be too sheepish regarding it. Let's not let it consume our lives and our passions, um, but not not be afraid of talking about it, discussing it either. Um, in the, the, I think the kingdom of God, it's important that we should be excellent in all things. So thanks for taking the time to join me on this episode. I pray that it's a blessing to you, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. God bless. I would trade a million lifetimes for a moment here with you.